perspectives, personality. Hi, thanks for coming to the Dynamic Store. We're an open dialogue webisodic series that highlights the larger than life figures that make the Microsoft Dynamics space a fascinating, fun, and unique community of professionals. This series of one-on-one -on -one interviews focuses on the platforms, perspectives, and most importantly, the personalities that are hard at work every day, implementing, enhancing, and maintaining business applications that run our global world economy. So what are you waiting for? Come step inside. Dynamic Store podcast. My name is Eric Laguer, your host of Dynamic Store TV, founder and principal of Laguer Recruitment and Dynamic Store. This is some exciting news as this is our first ever uh, episode of Dynamic Store TV. Couldn't have thought of a better guest to have with us today. Uh, who you're seeing right now is Liz McLennan, who is a Microsoft MVP, the founder of the nonprofit organization TechFluent co-host of the Dynamics Hot Dish podcast and D365 CE consultant extraordinaire, which is not a self-prescribed title, it is one that I made up. Liz has been working with the Dynamics, uh, with Dynamics and Microsoft Stack for the past 13 years, started her CRM admin, uh, started as CRM admin, moved on to roles in training, sales, delivery, and management for multiple Microsoft partners, she also has an MBA in human resource development and has been passionate about training and development since graduating college. Three years ago, Liz became an independent consultant, which carved out space in her life to follow her passions, which led her to starting a nonprofit and a podcast. She sees the demand for upskilling individuals in the Microsoft tech industry, and she knows that our few formal avenues to be able to enter into this industry. So her goal is to bring career opportunities to communities that wouldn't typically have access to them and specifically good careers in the Microsoft Dynamics space. Liz, thanks for walking through the door. Welcome aboard. How are you doing today? Great. I'm excited to be here on your first episode. Congratulations on, on launching this. Thanks. I'm thrilled. Can't believe it's happening. <laughs> so, uh, it seems that everyone loves good origin story these days. So, uh, tell us a little bit about yours. When did the Dynamics door open up for you? Sure. Yeah. So, I never thought I'd be in tech because I didn't really like math or science. And so, I never thought that there was a career path where you didn't have to be a coder. Um, so I got into the space completely accidentally. So I graduated from undergrad in 2010. I was a server at a country club and I desperately wanted to get out of the hospitality industry and into something professional. Um, and so I originally wanted to be a trainer, but there weren't entry level trainer roles open that I could find. So I took the first professional experience that, you know, where I got an offer and I landed as a sales operations person. So a sales coordinator role at a local tech company that does like data centers, cloud managed services, email called Vizzy. Um, it was acquired like while I was there, um, but they were a Microsoft partner. And so we got CRM 4.0 on-prem for free. And because I was involved with the sales team, they were using CRM. They were like, pull this report. Oh, I'm not using the system because we don't have these fields or these views. And so I just self-taught myself CRM and figured out how to do configuration work, got better connected into the channel and the Dynamics partner space. Um, we were using some power packs by Power Objects, um, went to my first summit and switched over to the partner side after three years of being an admin. Wow. Okay. 4.0. There's yes. uh, not, a lot, not a lot of you folks out there. That remember it was days so different back then we didn't have solutions or dashboards or anything but i do like that they were just circle. things in the sky yeah <laughs> wasn't a thing. upgrades were huge projects but i love how they've gone full circle on the ui and how they've gone back to like the net left nav and the tabs and it's like yeah you didn't need to go to that top navigation we could have just stayed with this this whole time but i get a kick out of that the things that kind of come back around 
Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty fascinating, you know, what what is old is new and new is old. That It's coming to a point where there's certain things Microsoft had tried out before and then fall through, and then they're like, oh, wait, hold on, we're back. Like, you know, you think of, like, Skype and links, and then it's just like, oh, no, well, okay, we made me, oh, here's Teams for free. There you go. With, with your Office 365 uh, subscription, here you go, you have it. And uh, and then here we are, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I feel like the origin of Teams was Yammer, their Yammer acquisition, and that was kind of their first, I don't know, forte into that collaboration space. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I don't know if you follow Ben Breeden, uh, Cap to Code, he's CEO. It's their, their F&O partner uh, primarily, but he just made a post about Yammer and how it's kind of an uh, underutilized collaboration tool uh, in the dam dynamic space. And if the with the right collaboration and message from the partner channel and Microsoft themselves, it could help, uh, it could be a tool that gets utilized more. We'll see. So it's really interesting you bring that up because I just read something about that uh, yesterday. That's Interesting. I didn't. I thought that was kind of like um, going away. I figured Teams was a replacement for that, but maybe I'm sure people still use it. And now I think on the latest wave release of D365, there's the ability to use Teams and chat through it on an account record and, and yes. all that stuff too. So that's, I mean, it's essentially kind of like the same functionality. I suppose. Um, but uh, you mentioned you started off with a, a local tech company. Um, where was local for you back in 2010? Are you still in the same place? Same place. Yeah. So I've always lived in Minnesota. Um, so met the first company I worked for was like 15 minutes away in Eden Prairie. Um, but the parent company was headquartered out of Chicago. Got it. Cool. I, uh, I once placed a uh, Dynamics Great Plains contractor in Eden Prairie once. Oh, wow. That's as close as I've ever come to stepping foot in Eden Prairie, but I know it's <laughs> west of, of uh, Minneapolis. Yeah. So, um, I've seen it on a map. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Liz, you have a really unique perspective and do uh, some of the challenges that the overall health and growth of the Microsoft Dynamics ecosystem uh, has in in your mind what do you think right now is the the biggest obstacle in the way of of a healthy sustainable growth for microsoft dynamics well, that's an easy one i don't think we have enough talent in our industry so i think there needs to be more people that have the skills on the d365 and the power platform and biz apps and m365 and that whole stack and of course ai now right with the recent announcement that happened this week yeah, chat, chat GPT with Bing. Uh, yep. <laughs> I want to steer off the course, bud. I know. I do. do you think people are actually going to start using Bing now? <laughs> I do. I have been playing around with chat GPT for a few months. I think when I, I heard of, about it, like a few weeks after, I don't know, it got announced. And it's so impressive. It's just kind of a game changer. And the fact that it's going to be combined with Bing and Edge, like, I think it just will change the way we interact with the internet and do research and create content. And I think Google is going to be in a tough spot if this really turns out the way I'm sure Microsoft hopes that it will. Yeah, it uh, it seems like the grass match draws. And it, every time I'm hearing the press on it too, it's like, and then Google is partnering with another service. And it's, it's interesting, they don't tell you who. And it's at this point, um, I follow Chris Lockhead's podcast um that is uh follow your different and he, he wrote a book uh think play bigger and it's all about the category kings of not just technology just you know, of any industry it seems like chat gpt has already solidified itself as the category king like that's who we talk about it's like kleenex to tissue xerox to copy you know yep. uh, it's it's really solidified there so we'll see what that future holds but uh in the near future um as far as the lack of talent, I agree with you. That's, I mean, to some degree, it serves me as a recruiter in this space who owns my own firm, uh, as it's more and more difficult to find, especially senior resources in Microsoft Dynamics space. People will pay a premium to to find those folks. What do you uh, What do you think is the recipe for ameliorating some of that pain? other than paying a recruiter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think there's a few different avenues. I mean, some partners have formal training programs, like consultant and training programs, where they can take people essentially off the street 
and train them from scratch. Um, you know, so I've seen those programs be really effective at a few partners I've worked for and I've been involved with that. So there are definitely employers and partners that have that, but there's a lot of small to medium sized partners that don't have the resources to pull off a whole training cohort themselves. And I've worked at um, as an adjunct faculty member at a state college and I just don't see higher education giving a formal path into our industry. Um, there's not like a major or a cert that you can get from a university that's like stamp of approval, like we focused on just biz apps or we focused on how to prep you to be a functional consultant. Um, and that was disappointing to me. Like I was teaching intro to consulting and intro to dynamics, but it was part of a PM degree and none of my students had any desire to want to actually get into our specific industry. And so that was another stepping stone. I did that for two years and I'm like, you know, I'm not going to change academia. Like I could try to convince the college to add a major for this or I'm like, or I can just do it myself in six months. <laughs> so, you know, and it, like with TechFlow and it's like, it's free, it's faster. We're removing those barriers of entry too, because so many people, you know, college university is not an obtainable thing because of the finances or the time or just their learning style. And so it's like, this is something our industry, I don't feel like a job in our industry is something that should require a four year degree. And that I think if you have the right values and just aptitude, you know, all the stuff is kind of teachable and trainable and you can you can learn um, through on the job or kind of a specialized training program. Fantastic. So, um, you know, in full disclosure, I volunteer with TechFluent and their their first class of learners. Absolutely loved it. Um, I when you landed in my inbox in LinkedIn, I read that and I I, I just and for what I do career wise, I've just had um, generally sometimes senior consultants sending someone my way like, hey, they want to get involved with this, talk to them. Or sometimes it's just you know folks right out of college that maybe even have taken a cert already. They're like, I want to do this. How do I do it? So I, I had already started mentoring some um, some young folks. I actually just talked to one the other the other day that you know I helped navigate some things uh, with who I might have a job for because it's been like a year and a half. But that's um, great. You know, so I was already doing that, and I was excited to be a part of it. Um, what I'm interested in is you saw this huge gap, this huge problem that exists of not getting the skills and training to the right people that will go into the industry. You saw it said you had the answer uh how long was it until you saw the problem until you came up with the idea of tech fluent like okay i can see clearly this is the solution this is what it's going to look like is it is what you've implement implemented and done so far to already be successful with the first class of learners uh does it still look the same as what you envisioned before walk me through some yeah of, of, of putting it tech fluent together yeah, um, I think like an idea doesn't just come crystal clear overnight, like you just lands one day. So I definitely am trying to think back of like, when was the first time this like started noodling in my brain? I was definitely a practice director at Stonebridge Software. So it was my first time having to actually hire for a team. And that was my like direct experience with, it's really hard to find affordable um, experienced resources. I also noticed at that time, the extreme lack of diversity that we have in our space. Um, pretty much everyone that was applying was kind of the same demographic. Um, and my like, and I left that role not knowing what I was going to do next. So I kind of took a few months off and that's when I decided to become an independent consultant. Um, so I was really in this process of trying to evaluate like what are my passions? What are my strengths? Do I want to stay in the industry? Do I want to completely do something different? Um, and like before I left, I had begun thinking of, you know, I like training, I like learning and development. And originally it was a for-profit organization idea. Um, and that summer of 2020 when the pandemic hit and I live in Minneapolis, so George Floyd was murdered. I was protesting and I was like, I could turn this into a nonprofit idea and actually make an impact for under-resourced communities that they don't know this career is an option and they don't really have a way to get their foot in the door unless someone helps with the mentoring and the training and the connection piece because it's really hard to land an interview if you don't have any experience any certs on your resume you can't afford to pay for a training or to 
to get the certs. And so that's really where I, I connected the two of like, I want to find this, like do something fulfilling that feels like I'm helping people and combine it with like my for-profit training idea. Right. Yeah, that's, uh, it, it, I'm glad that there was sort of like an inflection point that was like, wait, instead of this for-profit, I could do the most good by making this accessible to the, the people who are under server, um, you know, have seen this career path is sort of exclusive to a certain type of person that, you know, we, we see all too soon, uh, all too often in the industry, right? Um, a lot of Caucasian white folks in tech, you know, it's just, yeah. it is like, there's no denying it, um, at least in, in our circle of tech for sure. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And this bringing awareness too, like I dynamics and power platform are not household names. And so I'm passionate about that, like education piece of you. We don't teach any developer skills like we gear people to be functional consultants. And I'm a big fan of like, you know, bringing that awareness that you don't need to be a programmer to be in tech. There is a career path for anyone, any personality. You know, if you're an extrovert, go into sales, go into recruiting. If you like teaching people, go into training. And so I think that people just don't, enough people don't understand that yet about the tech space. Yeah. Oh, and uh, you know, it's going back to something you touched on when you were going over your origin story. You know, I thought you had to be a coder to be involved in tech. 100% guilty of that myself, all the way up until I got involved in, in, in tech recruitment. And, and now it's almost like there's more operational roles and uh, auxiliary type roles to text that don't involve writing a single line of code than I think there are software engineers working at a given time. And, I was uh, just talking to Microsoft about um, uh, career like role growth um, and based on LinkedIn data, the functional role has grown 14% over the last year and developer roles have only grown about like 2 or 2.5%. Yeah, low code, no code is here to stay. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting because my, my vision of that has always been a little skewed, especially because I've done a considerable amount of work recruiting the ERP space where there's far less emphasis on developers because that that cross section specifically like specifically with finance consultants where you like have to know accounting and you have to understand management information systems that's like for most people like boring right you know like well let's check our kind of cost accounting and journal entries and, and on a computer you know so it's uh yeah but the we, I, I, I figured most of that growth was coming to with uh, the advent of everything, just adding more features that are just customizable out of the box. Uh, it makes more sense. Um, next question, you know, it's one, so you have the big problem, you have the vision for Tech Fluent, nonprofit, great, we're going to do it. I imagine, or at least I'm imagining in my mind right now, the next big challenge is like, okay, this is our, we want to turn this outward. How do you find the people that want to be involved, right? And and how do you how do you craft a message they'll understand? Especially people that's like, wait, no, 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 you're not going to be writing code. Swear, but no, 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 you're not going to learn code. You're not going to learn code. This isn't like code boot camp or anything like that. You're not going, to, you know, we're, yeah. We're that. that was like an upstream battle. To it to people who are yes. coming from all sorts of different backgrounds, right? Last year, the first cohort, we had to work really hard to find enough learner applications. So, um, and definitely I kind of felt like I was cold calling people and people thought I was scamming them. Like they didn't trust me. They were like, what do you mean? I'm You're gonna give me this six month program for free and send me a laptop and pay for my certs? Like what's, What's the trick here, yeah, right? And I, I can get into this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I definitely have people like hang up on me and like just completely ghost me. And so we're past that phase now. We have had 280 applica applications compared to like the 70 applications we had last year. Um, but I am fortunate to be connected to a few BIPOC community members here in Minneapolis. So their networks were a great referral source for us as well as uh, an alum from a similar program, Power Platform School, that I actually helped with prior to TechFluent. Um, and so she also has been a great source of referrals um, and her network is all um, the immigrant population, which obviously I've learned a lot more about the challenges they face when moving to the US. And you know they have 
tons of higher education normally. I mean, I have people in my last cohort that have PhDs that couldn't get jobs here or they were underemployed because their their higher education wasn't from a U.S. university. Um, and so she's also been a great help, especially um, initially to find enough learners for our first cohort. But it grew that much just through word of mouth because now we have, you know, an alumni community, they all refer and our volunteer pool keeps expanding. We had over 90 volunteers with our last cohort. And so now that we're starting to gain traction and just the word is kind of out there, um, we have an excess amount of learner applications. Well, you know, and we have not enough spots. And so we want to grow. We want to be able to have more cohorts a year and larger class sizes, but um we need you know more support from volunteers and funding from the community to be able to accommodate that growth great and uh, following up on that too about uh, volunteers and support i know i helped you out a little bit with uh find some trainers what what type of if folks are out there listening that want to get involved how can they get involved uh what are you looking for right now in in ways that people can volunteer and be a part of what honestly i think i don't this isn't exactly objective journalism happening right now, but what I personally think is the coolest, most important thing going on in the, the Dynamics ecosystem right now. So how can people get involved? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Um, so we're all set from a volunteer perspective for our next cohort. Um, if we could get a few more mentors, that would be great. So if anyone sees this and you want to mentor, the next cohort launches on March 13th and the time commitment is one to two hours a week and you have a one-on-one -on -one working relationship with one of our learners. Um, so we actually just last night decided to increase our class size from 20 to 25 because we have so many qualified applicants. We have 65 to 70 people that want to be part of our program. And so we can't accommodate all of them, but we were like, let's add five more. So I'm looking for about four more mentors. Um, but we need trainers always. So even though we don't need them for this one, we love to have people apply and then you know we can kind of proactively have the conversation about the next cohort and if we get more volunteers in ahead of time then we are you know we have that information and then that can factor into our decision of whether or not we expand or maybe plan another cohort sooner um, so trainers to teach a class all sorts of topics you don't have to be technical we spend half the time teaching on soft skills um, we need um, your role always, Eric, as an industry coach. So we layer on another person to mentor for the last half of the program that's specifically helping with resume coaching, LinkedIn profile, job searching, and, and practicing interviewing, um, because that's a huge area that, you know, they need support and guidance in as well as how to prep and navigate that process. And we always need leadership members. So we have a, a leadership team of about we just added three people, so I'm trying to get the right number. I have about 14 people, but I need people. Um, I'm looking for someone in marketing and to help with fundraising and grant writing. And so if there's anyone listening to this that have those skill sets, I'd be really interested in talking to you about joining our, our leadership team, which is a commitment of about four hours per week. Wow, uh, yeah, a lot going on. And uh, you mentioned new leadership members. I'm just curious in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, how, I wonder how many of them I'm going to know. <laughs> you've, done a, you've done a fantastic job of getting people involved that generally most people if you've worked anywhere in this industry kind of know like, we have some big names you, yeah. yeah i feel very yeah. fortunate yeah i mean to be fair ben volvers everywhere <laughs> everybody knows Ben. that's true uh, so that, that one i think that was that was, was low-hanging fruit to get him involved probably he was i'm sure he was all on board the second you approached him too yeah so that was that's that's pretty cool you know, going back to the mentors, um, for you in, in your mind, what does the ideal mentor look like as far as like work experiences, what they bring to the table? Is it, you know, specifically you look for like senior consultants or maybe even project managers or who knows, maybe even like account executives working in dynamics. But I don't know. Let the Honestly, know. any of that would work. We're just looking for someone that, you know, has a bit of experience in the industry or recent experience in the industry. So I'd say at least three years um, because they are supposed to be an expert and kind of this more tenured senior person that's helping this new person understand their space. Because if you've never worked in tech, the Microsoft channel or a professional setting, 
there's a lot to figure out besides just learning the platform. Like we have all these this jargon and these concepts that are foreign. And so we don't expect our mentors to be technical experts. You're not the trainer. You're really their their guide and their go-to person. And so we want, you know, there to be a friendly friendly relationship where there's trust and they can kind of go to them with anything. Um, and then if they don't have the answer, you know, point them in the direction of resources, come to the leadership team, go to your broader mentor peer network, and people are really willing to help out. And then we try to match the mentor to the goals and interests and backgrounds of the learner. And so if we have a learner that has an accounting finance background, we think they're probably going to be more interested in pursuing an ERP path. And so we might pair them with an FNO mentor. Um, we have someone with a PM or a sales background, we'll pair them with a PM mentor or a sales mentor. Um, and we have plenty of like recruiters and talent acquisition people that have, you know, offered to be mentors too. And so it's really anyone that has industry experience. And then we just do our best to match the mentor skill set with the interests of the learner. Great, fantastic. And uh, I guess it, as far as uh, for people that are interested, what's the best way to reach yourself uh, to become a mentor, become a leadership uh, part of the leadership team or any other part of technical approach? Yeah, great question. So all the roles and role descriptions and expectations are on our website. Um, so I'd say check out our website, check out our open roles, and if you're interested, feel free to apply, but also feel free to, you know, message me directly on LinkedIn if you have questions or want to talk about it. Fantastic. Uh, you mentioned jargon, so I'm going to lighten it up a little bit now. You mentioned like jargon, and it just makes me think, sometimes Microsoft is really bad at branding, uh, or at least, you know, they have these good ideas and then the names change, changed and they're like, no, this is that now, or we're going to scrap that, but it's going to come back as this. Um, what are some of the, the maybe some, some technologies there in the Microsoft graveyard that you remember that maybe came back as a, a, a ghost of, of something else that <laughs> Are there any on the top of your mind that you can think of? That's funny. Well, when you were saying that, I was like, yeah, I just used FNO as an acronym, which I know is old, but like because they change the acronyms all the time, it's just well, like I just you're thought always you said AX. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like I still like to say CRM. I feel like CE is almost going away. But anyways, no, they change they change names all the time. Um, and I feel like when they name things, they really like app. And they really like the word insight. And I feel like so many things have the word app or insight in them that it makes it really confusing of like, what are you, what are you actually talking about from a product perspective with that name? And I think one of the best examples I have is like the legacy Outlook client for, or for CRM before they rolled out the new version. I still call it the legacy Outlook client because it's a lot more straightforward. One is like the app for Outlook and the other one is the app, the Outlook app. And so like oh. technically, and I'm like, no one's going to know if apps at first or after. And so the app in my mind is the new one and the legacy clients, the old one. But technically I'm not using the right names. But yeah, they like they like to rename things and make things really, yeah. really confusing. <laughs> From a recruiter's perspective, it is infuriating with all the different names and name changes, but then somehow the names are get abbreviated or mixed up a lot. So it, um, when I'm sourcing, and I might be giving away some tools of the trade here, but uh, I like to think my Boolean logic knowledge and skill set is, you know, at this point, it should be better than the rest. I mean, <laughs> it should be good <laughs> like, if it's not. I don't think I'd be here talking to you, but um, you know the OR functions that I have to put in to capture as many people as, as possible. So I'll be like MS Dynamic CRM or Microsoft CRM or Microsoft Dynamic CRM or MS Dynamic CRM or you know or MS CRM and then version OR and then now it's like OR M. Uh, or D365 CE or Dynamics 365 CE or Dynamics 365 for sales for and it's yep. oh boy it's it's just like the the boolean logic chains that have to keep going on and on and on for all these different permutations especially when looking at LinkedIn because people you know you choose whatever you want to call yourself on there and it's yep. uh, <laughs> 
it's been fun and interesting. Um, I get pinged a lot for ERP work on LinkedIn and I'm like, I am CRM. Like, I feel like my profile is super clear, but because it has D365, that could be F&O or BC. And so it's just like, no, I don't do that. But it, it's not that, it's not crystal clear. I'll, you know, we I'll say dynamics. You, <laughs> I'll send you some of the Boolean logic chains that I use when searching specifically for CRM folks like yourself. And I'll, I'll send it to you and the next recruiter that lands in your inbox asking you for FSM work, I think now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Finance and supply chain management. Uh, you can send them the Boolean chain. You'd be like, here, you know, let me help, help me help you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me that'd help be you. great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that will be coming up. Uh, Liz, you know, when, uh, when you're not consulting, when you're not being a nonprofit executive for TechFluent, what can we find you doing? How do you spend your time? Well, I live in Minnesota, so that completely depends on the time of the year because it might be negative 20 or it might be like 80 and nice and warm and sunny. So in the winter or in the summer, Eric? <laughs> uh, I, well, it's winter right now. And, you know, funny enough, I'm from the snow belt of, of upstate New York, like Rochester, New York area. So I'm, I'm no no stranger to brutal winters. And, and there's like really the only way you stay sane in cold places is you have to have some sort of winter hobby whether it's ice fishing snowboarding skiing snowmobiling like anybody who doesn't have one of those i find by and large very depressed people <laughs> <laughs> because it's a long time of the year where you have not a lot to look forward to yeah um, so yeah let's go with winter i guess it's mo i think it's important uh, when you live in those climates to have uh uh, things that force you outdoors for hobbies, at least, or maybe not, yeah. maybe not indoors. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I like a little of both. Um, so for outdoor activities in the winter, we like to do winter hiking and snowshoeing. Um, we also ski snowboard, but kind of a snob, and I think it's really boring to go here in Minnesota. And so I typically only do that when we go out to Montana. Um, okay. Yeah, um, we also recently got a hot tub for this winter, and so we've been enjoying that, and that's made a really big difference. Um, you know, outside bonfires are always nice if it's not too cold. But other than that, that's kind of the outside stuff. For inside stuff, like I really like doing puzzles and reading. Um, and I know you're very passionate about music, Eric, but I, I am too. So I play my piano, I play the ukulele, and I sing in a community choir. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, man, choir is always interesting to me, and I I think that's a piece in my musical journey that I missed because one of my uh, most recent bands that I'm in, I never sang harmonies on uh, with vocals before, and my mm -hmm. band she's just like harmonies, harmonies, harmonies. She looked at me the second time we jammed, she's like, I'm gonna make you sing harmonies. <laughs> So, and it's, it's just weird because uh, her voice and I, our, our normal singing voices occupy this middle range together. So it's forced me, and our bass player actually, who's much, uh, you know, 20 years our senior and like, you know, gentleman, he, he's doing the high parts on the harmonies. I, I'm occupying this low space and it's uh, it's been rather di difficult for me. I feel like with choir training, I would have, if I had had more access to that, my harmonies would be would be tighter. I mean, how, how are your harmonies? Well, I, I'm not a soprano. So in high school, I, I sang second soprano, which is right in the middle. And then now I sing um, first alto, which is right in the middle. So I'm always in the middle of the chord. Um, but I'm not a good like improviser. That's not a skill I wish I could, I don't know, figure out, learn how to do better. So I read music. And so I see the note and I sing the note. But like, if you just sang something and you're like, harmonize with this, Liz, like, I would struggle with that more because I just, I, I read music. And so I do what it tells me to do, but I, I don't create as well, I guess. I need a point of context too, because my banjo player would be like, I need you, a, you know, a fourth below or a third or fifth, you know, which normally are, are the intervals we harmonize at. And I need to have her sing her no i find it on the guitar and then i can see and then hit the interval away where i need to be and uh, and then use that as a reference point i just i i can't just do it off of voice right mm -hmm. and someone told me a long time ago and i it's 100 true i think is that the most difficult instrument you can play is your voice 
Uh, it, it's just, you know, there's no keys, buttons, strings. It's just you and this and some sort of innate sense of pitch. And uh, It's a lot of, like, breath work and how you posture your body. We have a new director this season, and we spend 20 minutes on warm-ups. And there's a lot of kind of technique that can make your voice sound better. I know a lot of people think they can't sing, um, but with like the right practice and coaching, like a lot of people can actually sing decently and they just don't know how to. Yeah. yeah. It's, I feel like everybody in life should be able to carry a tune. And yeah. So, you know? It, it's, and my, it's, yeah, my choir is not audition, so everyone is welcome. If you live in Minneapolis, check us out. But I kind of like that because it's like, you know, if you want to show up and make music and have fun, great. And there's not this, like, level that you need to be at. What's the uh, name of the choir that you're involved in? in Bloomington Corral. So it's in a, a, yeah, southwest suburb. Bloomington Corral. So you, I'm, I'm, sen- I'm detecting a little Western vibe. Are y'all wearing boots? And cowboy <laughs> no, that's just the name of the city it's in. So it's city organized. Uh, well, oh, well, I'm familiar with Bloomington, but yeah. there's a Bloomington Corral, or that's I'm the name. Corral like horses. You know, oh no, it's a corral is a different place. name for choir. I get where you got oh, to Oh, 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 <laughs> sorry. Excuse me, sir. It's corral. Yeah, it's exactly. Corral. It's corral. Ooh, wow. I feel. Uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But if you search for Bloomington Choir, you're going to, I don't know if you'll find it. So, yeah, you got to use the word corral. <laughs> corral spelled like a corral, like you where you keep a horse, like C-O-R-A-L? No, it's C-H-O-R-A-L-E. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so the, the difference is that we're not affiliated with, like, a religious, like, a church. Where choirs are technically church-based and corrals are agnostic, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, the, in the back of my mind, and you know, it's interesting because you really, I think as many people as I've interviewed in my life, which are thousands at this point, um, I, you have to like not ask assumptive questions in my mind. I'm like, oh, I wonder if this is part of a church. And I was almost going to think, oh, is it part of church? You know, that would have been assumptive and it would have been the wrong question to ask instead of a little bit more open one. And we eventually got to that point. So I, I generally in my mind have this predisposition and bias to associate of course uh, choirs with with churches i had no idea that there's even a preferred separate nomenclature uh for choirs that aren't with churches it's crazy yeah yeah and we just tend to sing we have a, a christmas concert so naturally so some of the music's religious then um but they do like we sang a jewish song and we sang a ukrainian folk song and so they like to mix it up but our spring concert is all broadway tunes and and songs from musicals and so it's it's fun i love show tunes Uh, (laughs) i lived in new york city for several years during my life and there's this little piano bar in the west village called marie's crisis and uh little, little basement dive with a piano there and it's show tunes all day every day and everybody gathers up you know elbow to elbow around the around the piano they're hanging up leaning against it wow Oklahoma okay. <laughs> you know people spill drinks everywhere because they're just it, it uh, sounds uh, really fun and of course it's in the West Village so like people are spilling 14 dollars 15 dollars cocktails everywhere <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it would just be one of my favorite places to hang out. And it was right down the street from Fat Cats, too. So you go see some jazz and then mix it up, sing some show tunes. Yes. I kind of I kind of miss those those elements. I mean, Austin has its, its own beautiful and robust music community that, of course, I, I play a tiny role in. Um, but uh, I do miss some of those aspects of the music in, in New York and, and the accessibility. Um, you know, I got an off the wall question for you. You've worked on a lot of dynamics projects, probably. Could you even ballpark how many implementations you've done and then? Like, any idea? No. I mean, and to be totally frank, I wasn't a functional consultant for that long. Like, I think I was only a functional consultant for about two years. So if you just say, you know, you were a delivery on an implementation, it hasn't really been that many. But when I was a trainer, I covered a lot of projects because I would just come in at the beginning or the end and do training on the system. But I still learned their whole system. I just wasn't the one building it out. 
And so when, and then I was in sales and then I was in leadership. And so when you're in the roles like training, sales and leadership, you get exposure to a lot more clients and implementations because you're not the dedicated functional consultant. And so, no, I have no idea. I couldn't even begin to, to count how many, no. <laughs> yeah. And what a great thing, like coming in at the end as a trend, like, boy, are we glad to see you. This was, uh, those things were close to the well, end. Well, <laughs> sometimes, but I can't tell you how many times I would show up for training and it would be maybe like one of the first interactions with the end users. So the project team isn't always, doesn't always get requirements from the end users, they should. But I've seen situations where they only talk to management. And so I would show up to train and it would be their first time seeing it and giving feedback. And it would be like, this isn't our process. This won't work. We can't use the system. And we're maybe a week out from go live. And I remember just feeling like sick to my stomach of like, wow, we've spent the last six months building this thing. And it's not at all in alignment with their process and their needs. And we'd have to regroup implement changes, postpone go live, redo training. And so it was always, I, I wish it wouldn't have happened, but that happened more frequently than it should have. Yeah. And, and that's actually, uh, this was said to me several years ago by a senior consultant. I don't know which particular platform they worked with, I couldn't tell you, but um, they said something to me that it, was, it stuck with me. And they were like, you know, the biggest part of my job and this is great for anyone to hear that's like considering being a functional consultant, doesn't know what a functional consultant does or anything, you know, especially if you're thinking people just code for a living if they work in tech. Um, she was like, Eric, at the end of the day, my job is between two things. I have to know when to make the business fit the system, but I also have to know when to make the system or to make the system fit the business. And I, it, and at first, I, you know, you know, I got confused repeating it, but you know, you kind of see yep. like the inverse of it. And uh, it was one of those, sit down and like, huh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, okay, how much money do you want? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is so true. We kind of forget, I feel like, about the people aspect of it, the, the the implementation, and that. I don't know. That's the biggest issue with user adoption, I feel like, is that we're a bunch of techie people coming up with techie solutions. But at the end of the day, it's people using what you're building and they bring all the, the their people humanness with it. And so you have to manage that. Like, yeah, you have to manage that of like the motivation. Why should I do this? Why should I change? People don't like to change. It's something new. It's scary. Could this replace me in my job? I mean, there's just so many different reasons why someone might resist a new um, software. Um, and I think it has to do a lot with like psychology and motivation and not about is the button in the right place or not necessarily. Like, I think we get too hung up on the technical weeds and, and just don't see the time and effort put into the people side of things. And it's harder, too, because it's squishy and intangible. And yeah, you, you can people kind of underestimate how important that is. Yeah. It's it's a lot of a lot of a lot of platform perspectives and personalities, just like the show, uh, the pillars of this show. And speaking of people, here's a fun question. Um, okay, so you're you're on a project. We'll go functional consultant hat, not so much trainer. Sure. You know, you're you're going on site, meeting with your client. You're going to do a a, a requirements gathering session with the stakeholders. What uh, person or fictional character, and it could be anyone, and they don't even have to be a business person, who do you think would be the absolute worst stakeholder to work with and, and have to do a requirements gathering session with? I was hoping you were going to ask me the best, but you did the worst. Nope, so, the worst. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'm going to go real person and I'm going to go political because it's probably the person I despise the most. And I'm going to say Trump. I think he would be a nightmare to work with and just really unreasonable and a big pain in my ass. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully okay, scaring's okay, allowed on your show. We're going to need to build a power app. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, and I like to say no when I'm consulting a lot in a nice way. In a like, trust me, this isn't really what you need. And I'm sure saying no to him would probably not go over well. <laughs> uh, could you imagine, like, deep into the project, there's like uh, 
multi hundred thousands of dollars like change order thing. <laughs> 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 no I mean, it's like the pm engagement manager's job to deal with something like that mostly and provide that umbrella but <laughs> yeah yeah i mean hopefully the project has a pm on it right and you're not yeah. doing that dual i'm playing every role because that happens sometimes with a yeah. functional consultant I was gonna say, especially if you started I, it sounded like you started with like kind of a smaller firm and actually i i feel like when you were at stone ridge they really weren't that big either they've exploded the past like two three years they have yeah, yeah. they yeah. organic yeah. growth and acquisitions they were just like oh who are these guys doing some stuff out in the midwest this this stone ridge peoples yeah they had about 70 people when i started there yeah um i uh know plenty of people from there in, in my career it's a good place uh i don't they're not even one of my clients right now and i send people there sometimes you know where i'll be like you know what i don't necessarily have anything in my book of business i think you should talk to stone ridge especially if they're coming from some of the larger uh partners and and have done you know a lot of consultants do the kind of merry-go-round ride okay i'll get off here at this stop and hop back out and get up you know they, they do the big ones and they're like oh we're a little tired of it let's do something new uh, yeah I'll, I'll, i often offer stone ridge as, as an idea it's like just talk to a recruiter over there internally, like, see what's going on, you know? They have a great culture, and I, I feel like they're a bit of a unicorn. Like, there's not a lot of that medium, privately owned type of consulting firm. A lot of them have been acquired um, right. over and time. This, I had this conversation with someone recently, too. I was like, man, I can't believe Stone Ridge hasn't gotten acquired yet. And I don't think they want to be. 200-person <laughs> mark, you know? Yeah. Uh, which they're, they're at both across the whole business um and yeah that's when you're like okay what are you guys selling and uh, apparently at least from my sources sources are saying that there's no desire to to sell that's what leadership always said while i was there so i would imagine that hasn't changed yeah yeah and uh i mean i think the biggest one too i think that everybody had eyes on was when arbella sold too and um a lot of people know nima in the in the channel and in the bang up job he's been done to really build that and I feel like there was a huge vacuum when Tribridge uh was bought you know purchased and became DXC where it's yep. like they they were kind of the Cinderella story on the stride top of their game well respected and revered in the space and it kind of left that gap I feel like to some degree Arbella kind of took up the reins there a little bit and like you know we're the new best coolest kid in town check us out and then uh was wildly successful uh i mean still you know it's still still are under organo uh, arbella it's been a uh, been interesting to watch to uh like that whole portfolio i'm also um cast uh the salesforce partner i was familiar with them too it's been uh been interesting yeah i always think of like there's uh, avtex power Object, sonoma partners and customer effective were like the big ones that uh, i was yeah all... because Good point, Aptex, T Tech, and then yep. Sonoma EY. Mm -hmm. What's the, the third one though? I, Power uh, Objects. Oh, right. HCL yeah. now. Power Objects, HCL now. But you said cli client effective or? Customer, customer effective was bought by Hitachi. So they were wow. kind of in the South um, the East <laughs> region. <laughs> A couple of these places may or may not be places I work with often. I should know the story. <laughs> Oopsies. Cool. Uh, so, Liz, uh, is there anything I missed that you want to share with the Dynamics world? While uh, I'm sure thousands of them are going to be tuning into this. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Um, I guess the last bit of news I'll share is that I've had about a six month hiatus to focus on TechFluent for my own podcast, Dynamics Hot Dish, but I am officially rejoining the team and we'll be having our um, first new team episode um, come out at the beginning of March. So Eric, I'm not sure when this one will drop, if it'll be before or after, but keep an eye out for the new Dynamics Hot Dish team and I'm excited to be back involved with that. Yeah, and I'm I'm happy to help cross promote that too. I uh, actually took some time to watch the pilot episode. I was like, all right, let's start from the beginning with this and 
Oh, yeah. geez, that one was rough because we didn't know how to podcast yeah. back then. <laughs> no, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I didn't want to bring it up, but you brought it up. So uh, it was just like, wait, what are we talking about? Talk about uh, this. <laughs> you know? yeah. So it was, it, it was pretty cool. And I'm glad I did it, though, because now as I go deeper into some of them, I can kind of get a better sense of, of the journey. And, uh, and it's with multiple people like that. It's a lot more difficult than just just this dialogue. So appreciate it. Um, so yeah, that, uh, that just about wraps up the show, folks. I'm Eric Lindgear, your host for Dynamic Store TV, and also founder and principal of Lindgear Recruitment, as well as Dynamic Store. We're a full-service, niche-focused boutique Microsoft Dynamics Recruitment firm. If you need any of those services, you can go to dynamicstore.com or just like everyone else, find me on LinkedIn. Liz, thanks so much for being a fantastic guest and our inaugural guest. Uh, so you uh, will always be able to stake that claim. It was fantastic to spend some time with you in an open dialogue format, getting to know you better and uh, getting to know a lot about TechFluent. Thanks for inviting me to be on and joining you. I really appreciate it and had a lot of fun talking to you today. Yeah, me too. I really like this was fun. And I, I designed this to be fun. So I'm 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 glad that you had fun too because I enjoyed it as well. Cool. All right. Take care. Bye. Dynamic.